Okay, awesome. Um, well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us to learn more about renewable diesel. Uh, my name is Alicia Cox. I am the executive director of Yellowstone Teton Clean Cities. Um, and I wanted to just give a little background on our organization before handing it over to Jesse. So Yellowstone Teton Clean Cities, we are a nonprofit and we're also a program of the Department of Energy. We primarily, um, or we focus on um, advancing alternative fuels in the transportation sector, as well as energy efficient mobility system, systems. And we do this primarily by partnering with uh, businesses, municipalities, individuals, and providing them the resources about um, the different alternative fuels that exist and um, just providing them the resources necessary to see if it makes sense to use in the in the vehicles that they operate. And we're fuel neutral. So we, you know, we talk about renewable diesel, electric, propane, um, natural gas, and we uh, focus on Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. So thank you for joining us. I don't want to take more time on that, but, um, and then I also wanted to introduce Jesse. Um, so Jesse Tarian is our project manager based in Montana, and he has been focusing on renewable diesel uh, a lot this past year and trying to get this um, to educate a lot of folks and get this out there. Um, so he has a PhD in biochemistry from Montana State University, and his thesis um, was actually on insights into key barriers to the implementation of biofuel technologies. So we are in good hands today. And then he also spent uh, four years as the director, chemist, and business manager of Full Circle Biofuels. Um, so he did kind of everything, <laughs> including making biodiesel. So um, I will hand it off to, to Jesse now. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Alicia. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Yep, my name is Jesse, and I'm in Bozeman, Montana. And I've been kind of working with Yellowstone Teton Clean Cities for years back when I was uh, making biodiesel here in Bozeman. And opportunity came to help promote things that I'm passionate about. So I jumped at it, and it's been pretty much exactly a year, maybe even today or yesterday. Um, but renewable diesel is something that wasn't really around when I was making diesel or biodiesel, um, it's it's fairly new and uh, and I think it, it is growing quickly and it is a great opportunity for us to reduce our carbon emissions. Um, and coincidentally, we have a, a plant here up in Great Falls that has been producing renewable diesel since late last year. Um, I had a chance to visit there. I couldn't go into the refinery because they were adding some stacks and stuff, but I've been up there a couple times, uh, looked around, and uh, I was trying to have this lined up so as soon as they were producing renewable diesel, we'd have it, we'd have it, but um, not surprising, it is all leaving our state. So um, I'm trying to drum up some interest and uh, and try and keep some of it here. Uh, there's also a plant in Wyoming that I'll mention. Um, so we do have it locally in Montana and Wyoming. So I'll get started here. I'm gonna go over some, some background, uh, then some of the benefits, emissions and maintenance um, of using renewable diesel, um, the production and availability, I'll go over some of that. And then just the final slide, uh, suggesting what we might be able to do to, to help this adoption. So some background, um, I thought I'd go over this. It's only two minutes quick and, and they touch on a lot of the things I wanna mention anyway, and I think it's pretty concise. So I'm just gonna go over this. Uh, Play this quickly here. So green diesel, diamond green diesel is, is interchangeable with renewable diesel. We can't hear the, or I can't hear the video. Oh, sorry guys. Okay. 
can you hear it, Jesse? Can anybody else hear it? I don't, I can't hear it. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no sound to the video at all. I don't know how to like share I can't that. hear it. Hmm. I can skip it. It's not a, it's not. Yeah. So he's just going over what, similar to what I, what I will do, but you can kind of see through the video, um, even though there's no sound, you can see it looks just like a, a refinery. It's just like a regular petroleum diesel. And, and it is in a lot of respects. So um, some some of the background here uh, it was for renewable diesel was first developed in the in the nineties. Um, the first big company to start producing it commercially was Nesti um, out of Finland. Um, now there are major production facilities in the U.S., Canada, Finland, Sweden, Germany, France, Spain, the Netherlands, and Singapore. I think there's a couple in Italy as well. Um, those are the big ones. Um, in 2021. Renewable diesel accounted for about 3% of the diesel fuel consumed in the U.S. Uh, and then this year, or late last year, recent, it uh, surpassed biodiesel production. So you can see the graph on the right, where renewable diesel was almost non-existent at uh, in the 2010s, and now it is set to take over biodiesel. Uh, so renewable diesel is chemically equivalent to petroleum diesel, but it's produced using fats, oils, greases, rather than petroleum. Uh, it can be used as a drop-in replacement fuel for petroleum diesel or blended in any amount with petroleum diesel without any engine modifications. So you can run 100%, you can run 5%, whatever you want, um, and won't really affect any of the operation of the equipment. You use the same transportation, trucks, rail cars, pipelines, as existing petroleum diesel, so there's no to upgrade any, any of that infrastructure. Um, nearly all uh, renewable diesel, both domestically and imported from other countries is used in California. And I'll get into this a bit more. Um, it's due to the economical or the economic benefits with their low carbon fuel standards. So <clears throat> the producers get um, upwards of a dollar in additional rebates through the state. So uh, as I'll explain, you'll see a lot of it goes there. Um, and I need to emphasize this, that renewable diesel is not biodiesel. They're both biofuels, but they're very different. Um, so there's a lot of confusion there sometimes. Some of the properties uh, of, and, and it doesn't help that I compare it to biodiesel. I mean, it is compared often to biodiesel and petroleum diesel side by side, so you can see the different properties. But um, a bio, or a biodiesel in the middle, petroleum diesel on the left, and the renewable, di renewable diesel on the right. So renewable diesel is, is better than almost at, at all um, specifications measured um, for diesel fuels. Um, some of the big important ones are, is the cetane. Uh, cetane's higher, um, the emissions are all lower, uh, and then it has better cold flow properties and oxidative stability than petroleum diesel. Also not shown here with numbers is that it's, it has a better shelf life. It stores better in tanks because it's not as uh, hydrophilic. It doesn't pull in as much water as petroleum diesel. And then biodiesel really pulls in a lot of water and can have a lot of uh, microbial growth in tanks. So that's one of the part of the, the downsides of biodiesel. So there are numerous benefits, pretty much all benefits. Um, so as I mentioned, the compatibility. So renewable diesel meets all the same standards that petroleum diesel does, and it can be used uh, in all the infrastructure and, and all diesel equipment, as I mentioned earlier. That's generators, vehicles, um, anything that uses diesel can use renewable diesel without any modification. And that flexibility um, is what enables renewable diesel to just replace diesel. It's an immediate drop in, um, and it can be produced from multiple feedstocks. So waste oil, waste cooking oil, animal fats, grease trap, grease, uh, virgin oil that we can grow here, um, and, and, and other natural products. There are fewer emissions all around. An NREL study showed that uh, both CO2 and nitrous oxides uh, were reduced by 65% compared to petroleum diesel and particulate matter Used by almost 90%. And kind of the 
driving force of this whole presentation is that we have producers in Wyoming and Montana now, and we have distributors, um, at least one distributing the fuel in our region. So that's great news. Um, back to the emissions, there's a few graphics you can find. Uh, the one on the right is, is offered by Nesti out of Finland. So their standards are a little different and their life cycle measurements are different because it all depends where the fuel is coming from, where it's going, how it's processed. The, the little chart on the left is uh, produced by or uh, published by California Air Resources Board. But what I'd like to draw your attention to on the left kind of shows it best. The, uh, to extract crude oil takes quite a bit of energy. So it's 10 uh, grams per megajoule, whereas collecting used cooking oil uh, is, is tenfold less. Uh, transportation in this scenario that they show is, is quite a bit more for renewable diesel, but the biggest uh, contributing factor is that last car on the right where burning renewable diesel has almost no tailpipe emissions. Um, and that is, that's some clever math. There are some tailpipe emissions, but because uh, the carbon was sequestered from the atmosphere, they call it a net zero because uh, it's a renewable fuel. There are there are emissions, but they are significantly less than petroleum diesel. And I can show you that in a sec. And then on the bottom, um, just some, some more specifics, um, lower particulate matter, lower carbon monoxide, lower nitrous oxides. Uh, poly, poly aromatic hydrocarbons are, are reduced quite a bit and that's those are kind of toxins and things you can smell in diesel and, and an impurity that uh, causes a lot of soot uh, and there are fewer 30 percent fewer hydrocarbons feel free to interject at any any point um, may skim over something and then on the right nesty's math shows a 90 percent reduction in emissions and again, that's primarily the burning of the fuel because it's renewable and they're able to offset all that. This sort of illustrates what I just finished saying, how much more clean burning renewable diesel is to petroleum diesel. There are numerous studies that actually have the similar picture. So I showed a couple of them, but the fact that it burns cleaner is because it is cleaner. It's a more, um, homogeneous mixture. It doesn't have these poly, poly aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, the, the carbon chains are more specific, specified. They're in a shorter range. It's not just a mix of all kinds of things. And that's one of the reasons it burns a lot cleaner. And cleaner burning means that there are fewer diesel particulate filter regens. And that's a huge issue that a lot of fleets have. Um, there's always some emissions related code that pops up and then the shop has to figure out what it is, uh, clean the particulate filter, do, you uh, deal with diesel exhaust fluid and all these other things. Um, cleaner burning also allows the injectors to stay cleaner longer. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the odor of the fuel itself is, is less apparent. The emissions also are, are less so. And uh, better storage properties than diesel because it doesn't absorb the water like uh, diesel does. So if you have fuel sitting in tanks for a long time over a season, petroleum diesel might be a better option for that reason. There's better cold weather performance. Performance, While it doesn't all um, operate to minus 40, you still have to add additives. And if we have, I can't I see if we have somebody from NREL, they have experience running renewable diesel through winters and, and have additive suggestions and, and they've they've tailored their fuel to exactly what they need. Uh, and then the I've read a few studies where engine oil will stay cleaner longer. So the diesel renewable diesel is less likely to get by the pistons and into the oil. So your engine oil can last longer, fewer uh, oil changes. I just made this up this morning. I was thinking about this while Lying in bed, um, I made I made an assumption here on the left that I'll go over. So let's just say you had a, a fleet of ten trucks, and they get ten miles per gallon. They get they are they're used twenty thousand miles per year per truck. So that's about twenty thousand gallons of fuel per year for that fleet. At four dollars a gallon, you're at eighty thousand dollars a fleet. Um, and again, these are all assumptions. And 
ballpark, I'm saying a renewable diesel might cost a dollar more per gallon. It may be two dollars more. Hopefully soon it'll be less than a dollar. Um, I don't really know exactly what it is because I haven't purchased any yet. Um, my assumptions further assume that uh, for this electric car in the middle, electric truck I'm going to talk about, that the EV charging is free, the electricity is free, the maintenance is the same as any other diesel truck, and the electricity is 100% renewable. Um, so on the, the first uh, box there, I have 10 trucks, and I'm just saying 100 carbon dioxide or 100 carbon emissions units. Uh, it doesn't matter what they are. So we have 10 trucks that are emitting 100%. Now, if we wanted to get green and reduce our emissions, we could replace one of those trucks with an electric truck. And that's what some places are doing, and that's that's fine. And it works, and I recommend it for a lot of scenarios. But you replace one of those trucks, I'm going to say it's, it costs you about $200,000. Um, it depends if you get grants or not. It can cost the same as a diesel truck with some grants. If you don't have a grant, it might cost a little bit more. And then if you use... Uh, Span that out over 10 years, that would be about $20,000 a year for that brand new truck. Now, you don't have to pay diesel for that truck because it's electric. And as I said, the electricity is all free in this scenario. So um, the fuel is less. The truck costs you another $20,000. So you're spending a little more that year, but now you have an electric truck. So you've reduced your emissions by about 10%. This one truck is not emitting anything. Again, that's assuming electricity is perfectly clean, which a lot of it isn't. So in that scenario, you're reducing. You have a 10% reduction in your carbon emissions, and it's about $12,000 for that year, or $1,200 per percent of reduction. Sorry if I'm getting a little crazy numbers that I could have gone over more quickly and just got to the point. But um, then the last scenario is that same fleet of trucks in the beginning, and now we just run renewable diesel in all of it. Um, if the fuel is a dollar more per gallon, we've upped our expense on fuel by about 20%. So we're spending 100,000 in fuel, but we're reducing our carbon emissions by 75%. So, so I, have a, I have a question for you. Go ahead. Um, on your dollar more for a gallon, that, that seems to be quite a ways off. The refinery was taught, it's like seven or $8 a gallon to produce that fuel. So we have Parkland here and at the end we can discuss, I've got some ballpark spot pricing is out of Idaho Falls, and it was between a dollar and two dollars more per gallon. Um, they're, I don't think they're yet getting it from Calumet. Um, and when I spoke with them, we didn't really get the exact number, but it was the price of the fuel plus the two incentives they get in California minus the freight would be what, it would, what they would sell it to us for if we could buy it in a large enough volume. And that wasn't anywhere near seven dollars at that time. Um, and that might be something that Evan can assist uh, with. Eligible for um, the California tax credits. Can you repeat that? You wouldn't be eligible for the California subsidies. No, we don't get it. And they, if we keep it here, we don't get it, of course, and they don't get it. So we have to we have to pay that as our premium to keep it here. So that's where the premium comes from. So Candace was mentioning something there. Oh. Um, Candace, were you, or is it Evan was going to weigh in? Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. I was just going yep. to throw that to to Evan because he can explain, um, you know, why the dollar credit is there and why, um, if you're actually uh, selling or delivering the product into a state that doesn't have the incentive, uh, why you have to cover that credit. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So I. I I think the biggest component is the RIN in the, in the pricing and, and that's, you know, most of the product that's sold outside of California, um, there's a RIN component on it and quite often it's stripped off and, and either sold or used for an obligation that a counterparty might have. But if you're, if you're selling a RIN list renewable diesel gallon, um, you know, from a high level, uh, you know, I would say a dollar, a dollar ish over um, over NYMEX would be uh, would be a ballpark pricing, and that's subject to change all the time. But that that's a decent uh, benchmark. So the RIN for everybody is the renewable energy credit that's tied on most for all biofuels, including biodiesel. And they can separate that at the site where they produce it and sell that to a, a third market or, or a secondary market. 
um, and then sell the fuel without that ran attached. And some obligator buyers need to have that ran attached. So, um, so yeah, again, this dollar premium is, it, it's probably just a little bit low, but we won't know until we actually get some fuel. I mean, INL might have an idea because they are buying it, but I don't know if that's something they would share. But, but even, even so, if, if it were $3 premium um, in my scenario, it's still a much cheaper uh, method for reducing carbon. So in my scenario at a dollar, that's a 75% reduction for $20,000. If you're paying a $3 premium, it'll cost you $60,000 to reduce your carbon emissions by 75%. And I can't think of an easier, more cost-effective way to reduce your, your carbon emissions. Um, I mean, there's compressed natural gas. There's a, there's a few there's different options for different places that may work better for other reasons. But um, just as an oversight, this is a very easy uh, replacement to reduce your carbon emissions. And the disadvantage is that it costs a little bit more, but it's a lot cheaper than, than the other alternatives. And then in addition, you have to weigh in the reduction in, um, in, the, in the maintenance costs, the, the diesel particulate filter, the oil lasts longer. There's, there's, a, there's a few other bonuses to it. And then the emissions for the driver and the community in which it's operating. So production and availability. Um, as I maybe alluded to earlier, the, until recently, most, if not all, the renewable diesel that we wanted to burn or use around here would be brought up from California or Texas. Uh, this fuel could have originated down there, could have originated in Finland, Singapore, and the Netherlands, or even Wyoming gets shipped to California and then comes all the way back up. So the extra shipping and associated costs made it very difficult to acquire the fuel in our region. And because as, as we just discussed there, the, the, the LCFS credits in California and Oregon, Washington and British Columbia, and I think soon to be Canada will have a nationwide uh, low carbon credit. This is where all the fuel goes because that's where the market is. So it's been very hard for us and we are forced to make up that premium if we want to have the fuel here. Um, but now that we have it, here in Wyoming and Montana, it, it's just that credit that we really have to compete with or, or pay that premium. So at the beginning of 2022, in the top left, you can see the states in dark green uh, are the states that had renewable diesel refineries. Uh, and these refineries are often modified petroleum refining plants or they're built at existing or operating refineries. And Numbers are suggesting uh, that renewable diesel production will likely double by 2025. As I mentioned, it already surpassed uh, renewable or uh, biodiesel. So in 2023, so this is late 2022 and into 2023, here are the new plants that are coming online, including the one in Great Falls. Um, and then the, yeah, there's a second one in, in Wyoming. Um, so we have all of these, these new plants coming online. And again, most, if not all, are retrofitted existing petroleum refining plants. So with all of the, all those uh, production facilities, it's want to see where you can buy it publicly. And there are almost 600 stations in California where you can buy it, one in Oregon, and none anywhere else. And this is something I was trying to work with, um, with Parkland and our local uh, sales rep if we can find a station in Montana, maybe it was a key station in Wyoming where we can sell it. It's not logistically it can be done. It's just, is the customer willing to pay extra to have it? But that would be a great goal. We could be one of the only three states in the country to have renewable diesel available to the public. Um, current, customer, current consumers that I'm aware of is Stillwater Mine. Um, that's here in Montana, the platinum palladium mine. They've run biodiesel for years and when renewable diesel became an option, I think it was a better option for them. And so I believe they're burning it at 70% year round. And of course, Idaho National Lab is burning quite a bit of it. There may be others that I'm not yet familiar with, but um, those are the ones in our region. And then below here, 
of course, these are all in California, but the point of this slide was to show everybody the, the different industries that can use it. So there's a Hornblower Cruises in California. They run it in all their cruise ships. The municipality, Oakland, California, they're all of their municipal trucks. Every single truck runs 100% renewable diesel. Uh, there's a few waste collection trucks. There are uh, fleets down there that use it. Uh, large freight companies use it. Numerous school districts use it exclusively. Paving companies, farming, um, and mining. They're all using it. So it's not one industry that best uh, utilizes renewable diesel. It's, it's pretty much every industry can use it. So just a couple more slides here. We can chat and ask questions, but uh, what can we do to help help keep renewable diesel and, and make it available for us here in our region? So of course, it's just increase the demand. That's the easy one. Um, ask for renewable diesel and be willing to pay a slight premium for it. I think that premium will go down. There's always talk of a national fuel standard, renewable fuel standard. I don't know if that will happen, but there's there's talk all over the country for how to uh, incentivize renewable fuels. Legislation's an option. Senator Marianne Dunwell here, state senator uh, in Montana, proposed a bill. Um, it was tabled, but it would have offered tax rebates for producers, retailers, and consumers of all biofuels. Um, there, there was a second uh, bill she put out that was specific to consumers that would actually give them a dollar credit per gallon up to a certain amount. Um, that, that could help a little bit, but that, that was tabled. Um, one thing that I've always thought, any big project, if a city is having some road built or something, you could have that in the, in the contract asking that uh, priority would be given to a contractor who would run X number of gallons or X percent of renewable diesel or exclusive renewables, or you could make it a, a incumbent on your usage of renewable fuels or renewable diesel. It's, that's pretty easy and it would add a small percentage to the overall project, but it makes a statement and, uh, and gets has cleaner burning fuel in your area. Uh, there could be some regional requirements, so the national parks could could suggest something like all this, uh, all the fueling stations within the park must sell renewable diesel, and then I mean, you sort of have a captive audience that they want to protect the parks. They got to spend a little more on fuel. They probably already are spending. Um, state fleets could require that that it, it be used, and having it available at a public pump could facilitate that. Cities and and uh, municipalities that have mandates to reduce their carbon emissions. This is probably the easiest implemented mechanism for reducing your, your carbon emissions. It's, it's immediate uh, and it just costs you a little bit extra on fuel. People were willing to spend $5 or they had to spend $5 a gallon on diesel last year and the year before, and now it's gone down. If they just pay $5 more, they're back to where they were and they're reducing their emissions significantly. It is part of a LEED certification, so you can get quite a few points um, when you're doing LEED certified builds. Uh, I've never been on one of those specifically, but uh, you do get a certain number of points for that. Of course, these are just ideas I've come up with in the last few days. Um, there may be other ideas uh, that we can discuss how we might keep the fuel here, um, but I'm open to questions and ideas. So thanks for everyone's time. and. It's a picture of me at Calumet uh, last month. So are there any questions or suggestions or ideas? Um, Brandon's mic isn't working, but he had a question. Um, is, why does there seem to be such a market gap on the East Coast and Midwest for renewable diesel? Well, I, I, think, it's, I think partly the fuel is so new that a lot of people don't even know about it. Five years ago, I hadn't even, I mean, I could have heard of it, but I, it's not, it wasn't something that you could get. Now people are starting to understand about it, but you still can't, can't buy it. So it's hard for people to ask or even know about it if it just it gets produced and disappears. Uh, Calumet here in Great Falls has, they have Montana Renewables is the LLC that runs that side of things. And it just says Montana Renewables. That's all it says on this huge plant. So nobody, there even really knows that renewable diesel is a thing. Um, 
just gets on a rail car and disappears. So I think we need some public education and then that should drive some of the demand. But we just, we have to compete with the credits on the West Coast and sort of for now. I, I think I have something to add to, to that question. Um, most recently, we've looked at a lot of uh, customers that we have, uh, Parkland as a whole, um, throughout North America. And there are certain industries that have a directive um, to actually do renewable diesel conversions. And some of these industries are doing it without a great concern for the cost because it's more about meeting their sustainability goals and meeting them in a timely manner. So we actually do stuff um, in the, the Midwest and then we're making our, our way towards the extreme Northeast with some requirements that we've gotten from some of our contractual customers to actually go ahead and start the process of converting from a regular ULSD to a renewable diesel blend. So Candace is with Parkland and Parkland is an existing distributor throughout our region and already distributes fuel to many places. So it's it's pretty easy for them should somebody be more renewable diesel to just plug it into that same truck that's going there. Um, and, 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 yeah. and I don't know, Evan, I mean, do you want to comment on logistically, um, you know, uh, how it makes its way to these different pockets of the country? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the challenges is logistics and distribution. And I think Parkland's done a great job, um, you know, in the Idaho, Utah and Montana regions to to provide it. Um, in in kind of the northeast, I, I think it is a distribution logistics. Uh, most of it would come in by rail, and then uh, you know it needs to move off a rail car to a truck or to a tank, depending on if, if the end users want to, want some blends. Um, and I think ultimately, as this market ramps up, you know it would probably hit the the east coast uh, by marine as well. But uh, there, you know in the interim, uh, there's plenty of rail options available should someone uh, desire it. Mm. Yeah, that was that was a hope I had was that we could get people in a region that, enough of them to to warrant having a rail car delivered to make keeping the cost down. Um, if if we can commit get enough people on board, the demand that helps the demand, and then we can get us maybe possibly a slightly better price, and then hopefully that helps everybody. Yeah, and, and I'll comment on one thing. Um, we have some customers who like to, um, you know, actually <laughs> burn an R99 or an R75, but the majority tend to do um, R25 or R50, depending on the time of year. So the lower the percentages of the R99 that's blended with the ULSD, it does drive that overall pricing down where it's a bit more digestible than if you're choosing to burn just a, a straight R99. Would, would cost be slightly less if you were to just get R99 directly as opposed to needing to blend it? Does that blending add a penny or two or three per gallon? No, blending it with a ULSD actually gets your, your overall cost of that blended product down. It's when you buy a straight R99 that you're absolutely gonna pay that to dollar credit if you're taking it into a state that doesn't have that incentive. Um, and that's kind of what I think Evan may have mentioned that earlier, but uh, he's better versed on the, uh, RFS requirements and such, but there's no dancing around that dollar unless you're sending it back into a state that has the incentive right now. But where, where we've seen success in selling higher blends of renewable diesel or just straight R99 is the fact that if you have a company who looks at both the emissions output testing for obvious reasons, but then also they look at the fluid analysis and they can determine that they're able to extend maintenance intervals. If you've got someone sharp enough to share that information with a procurement group, then even though you're paying more for your product, you are saving X internally. So if you net those, it actually could get your true cost down to a more palatable uh, cent per gallon number. Hmm. So currently Parkland is distributing 
renewable diesel out of Idaho Falls. Is there any other hub regionally, Montana, where, well, I know they're going to Stillwater, so that, is that coming from Idaho Falls, that fuel No, well? no, no, nothing's coming out of Idaho Falls today. Anything that goes into Montana is actually coming out of a rail facility that we own in Ogden, Utah. Uh, so most of the stuff that we send into Nevada or into Montana is actually railed into Ogden, and then we truck it where it needs to go. Uh, there are plans to expand and start railing R99 into the Idaho, uh, excuse me, Idaho Falls location. Um, we just uh, have to get the tanks ready and get the green light before we can do that. It looks like um, both Amy and Karen have questions as well. I think Amy may have had her question, her hand up first. Hi, yeah, I'm the sustainability specialist for Big Sky Resort, um, and we are interested in like using renewable diesel for our snow cats and a lot of our heavy um, yellow iron equipment, things like that. But we got priced for from our current distributor at like seven dollars for R25. Um, so that's not a slight premium; that's a significant premium. So, is there an effort to get interested parties together to really show that demand so we could? Um, like you're saying, Jesse, that we could truck it in at a cheaper price. I've kind of been reaching out to my own network to see if our partners and our like, you know, community is interested so we can get it at a cheaper price. But we are willing to pay a premium, but just not at that significant of a premium for only R25. Yeah, if you guys, since this call is being recorded, um, obviously, like we can't be very specific at where, you know, where we would price you guys, but if anyone wants to take it offline, since I believe our, our contact information is shared, um, we can definitely put some um, econs together for you and, and show you what it should look like. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there are a couple of folks from CNB on this call anyway. Um, I see Jason Bliss, who's a the sales rep for CNB, so we can absolutely uh, take this offline and get you some, you know, numbers so you can compare. Would appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, this is Karen Hilding, and um, yeah, I'm with the City of Whitefish. And what I'm wondering, um, I think here in Whitefish. Um, there may be interest on the part of the city, you know, obviously we have a lot of equipment that uses diesel, but also the um, uh, ski resort, which um, Whitefish Mountain Resort is now a partner with Protect Our Winners and with Explore Whitefish, our visitors and convention bureau. Um, and that was one of my questions for Jesse, I guess is, um, you know, have you done a presentation yet to Climate Smart Missoula to kind of get the word out throughout or sorry, Climate Smart Montana, um, to get the word out throughout the state. Because it, it seems like, yeah, if we had several cities and a couple of ski resorts that were interested, um, that could um, impact this, you know, the, the cost, the price we're talking about if, if you had several interest, interested. So that was one question. Have you done a presentation yet to that state? Um, uh, group that that meets monthly and then um, and then the other question is just whether there are other cities in Montana that have expressed interest so firstly no this is the first uh, kind of public presentation I've given on renewable diesel my first month with the Yellowstone Teton Clean Cities I gave I gave a presentation it's sort of my way of learning and researching so kind of research things that I want to talk about and I learn in the process. So it was just kind of a learning, learning slideshow for me. Um, but no, I have not. This is the first one. I'd love to, the chance to, to talk to anybody about it. Um, I think everyone just needs to know about it. And uh, so, yeah, if you have any contacts, we can share this presentation with them. I can have a call with them, whatever, whatever they would like. Um, yeah, I'll forward you the contact I have that Paul LaChapelle for that uh, group. And then um, as far as other cities, <clears throat> I know Bozeman has um, some carbon goals that they need to meet. So I think well, despite not being explicitly interested, I think they have to be and they will be. And um, this uh, city of Billings has a whole committee uh, 
for this kind of thing. And I've had a hard time getting into one of their meetings uh, or contact. I, I've spoken with their uh, publicity marketing person there and she says that there's a lot of interest, but I haven't heard much. So I assume, I mean, they're, they're a lead certified city. They have 13 CNG uh, garbage trucks there already. So I can't see why they wouldn't be interested. I reached out to, to Belgrade. Um, I found somebody at Butte. It was kind of last minute. I just wanted to get this out as soon as I could before we waste our whole summer. So um, I'm happy to do it again and, and talk with any cities. Yeah, I think we could have set up a, either I could provide this recording or we could have you do a separate presentation to our uh, climate action plan committee for the city of Whitefish. And um, at the same time, we could invite folks from the, from Whitefish Mountain Resort to that presentation and kind of get everyone in the same. Yeah, with Big room. Sky Ski Resort interested, um, Bridger Bowl is very interested. I don't know if Bonnie's on the call here, but they're very interested. So I think, I think it's a common uh, goal for ski resorts to mm -hmm. like this. Are there any other questions or thoughts on how we might help spread the demand, increase the demand? Well, I think it'll be great to have this recording available so we can share it with other folks. And again, as Candid, Candace uh, mentioned, some places might burn 25. You can burn any percentage you want to help absorb some of that cost. If you wanna do 5%, it's better than 0%. And if others are doing it and say we've displaced 5% of our petroleum product, that's, that's something I think worth, worth publicizing and, and has benefit. With um, the, the pricing of the fuel, if there's enough interest um, from multiple entities, is there a uh, I guess maybe you don't know this off the top of your head, but could you all look into like what the amount of fuel to our region would need to be to reduce the price? Because then that gives us a amount that, that we can go after and know because um, we know the fuel use of various different municipalities and, and um, businesses. And then um, I feel like rather than just kind of hodgepodge ask people, like we'd have a goal to meet and, to be able to get that price for our region. I guess that's for Candace, maybe. Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in. For I mean, mm -hmm. it, as it relates to volume, uh, a rail car holds about 27,000 gallons. So in a perfect world, it would be great to, to have that sort of demand that we could at least distribute um, in a short period of time. And by that, I mean days that we could go fill tanks at that volume. and. Um, you know, ultimately, if it's truckable from a, a local source, uh, renewable diesel plant, that that volume would be a little bit lower. But for rail cars, you know, I'd pencil in 27,000 gallons. Great, thanks. Well, if that's, if that's it, we could wrap it up. Um, Feel free to, to email questions or, or ideas or people who might have questions or uh, and we will share this recording and um, anything else we get. Again, I, I think, and I knew it would be the, the, the linchpin to the discussion is what is the cost? And um, yeah, I guess any efforts we have to get that cost to a, a known area that people can then plan for, I think is helpful. All right, well, I guess that ends the uh, renewable diesel call. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Thank you.